Hello and welcome. My name is Jake Wilson and I'm with WGU's Information Security Team. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Issues of Cyberbullying in Today's Modern World. This webinar will be recorded. Our speaker today is Tina Meyer. She's the Executive Director of the Megan Meyer Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. So good afternoon. Um, I am really happy to be able to be here and share not only Megan's story, but also the hope is, is to be able to talk more about the issues surrounding bullying, cyberbullying, suicide awareness and prevention. And my hope is, is that it's able to sometimes work within your workplace um, to be able to have conversations, discussions, whether it's you personally, or maybe it is with your children um, or friends. And so I am really happy to be able to be here. My name is Tina Meyer, and I founded the Megan Meyer Foundation. And our sole mission is to be able to support and inspire actions to end bullying, cyberbullying, and suicide. Why I still talk about this, um, you know, many times I've traveled across the country to schools um, and spoke to students and parents and educators. And, you know, sometimes you think if you've gone out and you've worked in, a, in an organization and you've talked about a situation for long enough that maybe things would get fixed and things would get better, right? And the reality is, is that while we are doing a lot to provide supports for mental health, we are seeing that there are still many people who are struggling with thoughts of suicide or attempts. And so what we're wanting to do today is not place fear. Um, this is, presentation is based on real situations and facts, but it's also about awareness and prevention and making sure that we get to the right supports so that we can get help. Um, but one of the things that we are seeing through COVID, through all of that, is that there is a lot of people struggling and trying to find out where do they go for supports for mental health. Um, and one of the statistics that we've seen that just came out recently shows that nearly 60% of female students and 70% of LGBTQ students have experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. They show that 10% of female students and more than 20% of LGBTQ students attempt suicide. Black students were more likely than Asian, Latino, and white students to make an attempt. 18% of high school students made a suicide plan in the last year, and the highest rates ethnically among Native Americans. And I share those statistics with you because I want to make sure that we understand that it is okay to talk about this when we talk about it in an informed and educational way, a caring and an empathetic way, we can save lives. And so that is why I share this because we have so much more work that we need to do. We need to have studies and programs within all college campuses, all schools, all workplaces, so that we can live the lives that we want. Um, you know, how I kind of uh, came full circle into this was not because I went to college um, and decided that I wanted to be a public speaker on this public health topic. It was strictly because of my daughter, Megan. My daughter, Megan, we live in Missouri, um, was my firstborn. She was just this amazing, bubbly, fun kid. But Megan, from a very early age, struggled with her self-worth. Um, it what Megan was came into the world at nine pounds, so she was not a tiny petite child. Um, she was the kid that was always taller than the other kids, looked like she was in second grade compared to the kids in kindergarten. You know, and when they're little, kids say things, right? It's, you know, you're tall or, you know, you're a giant or your hair is weird or different things that, you know, a lot of times we've kind of said to kids, you know what, don't worry about it what other kids say. Many times kids can move on about their day, but there's a lot of kids like Megan that took everything to heart. And so in kindergarten, when they would make fun of her legs, tell her she was tall and a giant or had thunder thighs, Megan would come home, tell me that they were being mean, they were calling her names. You know, and back then, I didn't know how to really address it. All I knew was, you know what, I'm going to support you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to tell you just ignore them. You're perfect the way you are. 
let's go outside and play. Things are going to get better. And we kind of move on about the day. It's what I was taught when I was younger. You know, turn the other te- cheek, Tina, be the better person. So we never went to a class that taught us like these skills on when you child encounters this and emotionally they're struggling, what do you do as parents? Um, so I just did what I was taught. Megan now was entered into first grade, second grade, third grade, you know, and in third grade, Megan was, oops, sorry. Um, Megan was a kid that had friends. So if you would have went and looked at during the school day and looked at her, you would have seen that she was playing on the playground. She was sitting next to kids at lunch. She was smiling, right? But what was happening is that Megan was the kids that would make fun of her were in the popular crowd. These were the kids that everybody wanted to sit next to, be on their team, go to their house to spend the night. And if you were gonna fit in, you were gonna fit in with this group of kids. Megan thought that if she could just befriend them, buy them things like scented markers or candy or invite them places that they would stop making fun of her. You know, and I would always tell her, Megan, honey, those those kids are using you. That's not true friendship. One night in third grade, I was trying to get her to sleep and she was crying and I could not get her to bed. And I sat in her bed and I said, talk to me, what is going on? And she said she wanted to kill herself. And for a third grade child saying that, I was not prepared. That was nothing I ever thought would come out of my child's mouth. And I panicked. I I didn't know what to say to her. I ran into my bathroom sobbing, thinking, do I call 911? Do I call her doctor? I'm not sure what to do. I went back in her room and sat in her bed and I said, Megan, honey, come on, talk to me. Why would you say this? Because I thought maybe... She just had to have overheard it from somebody else. There's no way she could have really known what this was, was, this was about. Megan knew exactly what it was about. She knew what she would do. I said, I slept with her that night because I was so scared. And to this day, I still have no clue how she knew about it, where she learned about it, but she knew. I took her to the pediatrician the next morning pediatrician said, Tina, she needs to go to a psychiatrist and psychologist. That took us several months to be able to get in, unfortunately. And during that whole period of time, back then, and still even the stigma with it today, is that talking about this topic, it's sometimes so hard for us as adults to talk about it, parents, let alone, when we don't have answers on how to immediately fix it, we start feeling like, we are the bad parents, right? We're doing something wrong. We're not raising our children, right? Because it looks like everybody else on the outside is doing everything perfect. And and so many times we kind of keep it close to us. Um, It's also because everybody always has suggestions when they've never really walked that path, right? Family and friends, and you need to be strict. You need to do this. You should do this. You should do that. And Everybody always has suggestions and sometimes it's just overload. And so I I did that as a parent. I kept quiet because I didn't want that. Megan, after several months, finally got in and was diagnosed with depression and ADHD. It took me a while because I was worried. Um, I didn't want to change Megan's behaviors with medication. Um, Not her behaviors, really more of her personality. Um, The way that she would interact because she had the best sense of humor was funny, um, just goofy, and I was afraid it was going to take that away from her. But realizing over time with the therapy that to be able to give her the best ability to have, you know, be in class with kids and have good relationships, we were going to have to try that, which we did. Megan entered fourth grade, um, and then it was fifth grade, and then going into sixth grade. You know, fourth grade was a much better year, but it was one of the things, yes, therapy and medication, but she had a phenomenal teacher that really saw Megan for who she was and didn't get frustrated with little things that would happen. And she really, you know, connected with Megan to make Megan feel special and to make Megan feel smart and a part of everything, which was a phenomenal year for us. 
But, you know, things change and they enter middle school and middle school is a big transition for kids. This is where we see quite often from the studies that show if, if kids are in the traditional elementary school from about kindergarten to fifth grade and then transition over into sixth grade, we see that the peak of bullying usually is peaked at spring of sixth grade. And that is typically because the kids are in school for the first part of the, the fall, and then they go through holidays. And then by that time, there's been many different things that they've been trying, right? They've tried telling them no, maybe they've told a parent, told a teacher. And sometimes when these things don't work out in that spring, because we have from the spring all the way to summer, a longer period where all of a sudden it just starts peaking and that is where we always have uh, get many more calls. Parents struggle more, schools struggle more, and then the the studies kind of go down a little bit from there, from seventh grade, eighth grade, and then it steps down. But definitely the peak is the spring of sixth grade. So Megan, uh, sixth grade wasn't quite so bad. Um, seventh grade was pretty horrible and. And to give you an idea of Megan, Megan was, of course, not a perfect child. Um, Megan was a very caring kid. Um, she did have friends. So intellectually, there was no issues with that with relationships. This was more of the ADD, more of the behaviors, more of the impulsiveness, more of the trying to fit in or get people to understand or like her. And it was usually on the group that was the popular group, right? So. Megan during this year would sometimes struggle with work. You know, she would be too busy talking and trying to give things away to try to befriend those kids that were being mean. So a lot of times she would kind of get in trouble from class of, you know, you're talking, you, you know, where's your homework? What are you doing? Megan was just kind of in that typical circle of kids with ADHD where they struggle with friendship relationships. They struggle sometimes with um, teachers and adults of uh, being able to listen and sit still and and follow through. And then with parents, when they come home, parents are the ones that are always trying to say, you know, where was your homework? Why didn't you complete your test? I just got a call from this friend's parent that you did this. And so it's sometimes this cycle that they sometimes feel like they're the bad kid. And it's what I hear so often from kids that will say, I'm the bad one. And so if anybody is struggling with um, a child like that, to be able to really sit down and let them know they're not bad, that sometimes their choices, sometimes our behaviors aren't the best choices, but they're not bad kids. Megan, though, this year, um, seventh grade was going through all of that, but then I started noticing a change. And the change was, one of the big ones was she was not eating lunch. She didn't tell me um, she always bought lunch and her lunch account was at zero and I went and put money in her account and then I noticed nothing was coming out and I went to school one day and I peeked in and I saw her sitting at a table with friends, but she had a water bottle and a napkin and all the other kids were eating. And when she came home that day, I confronted her about what's going on. Why are you not eating lunch? And she finally told me what the boys were saying. What the boys were doing were stomping behind her on the lunch line, calling her a fat cow and an elephant to the point that Megan stopped eating lunch. These were the same kids that through the years knew that what to do, what to get to Megan was to talk about her weight, to talk about her size. They knew that that got to her. And so they would do small things all of the time just to be able to dig at her. I said, Meg, honey, come on, I've told you about these boys, just ignore them. If you ignore them, they'll get bored and tired, Meg, they'll move on. She looked at me and said, Mom, could you do that if it was you? And so often I think that we as adults will tell children, um, you know, just do as do as I say, not do as I do. Right. Or, you know, I went through things similar to that and look where I'm at now. You know, it's a rite of passage. It's going to be fine. The reality is, is that we tell them things so often that we would not be able to do in our everyday lives either. And so taking what kids are saying, just ignoring it, then go to class, 
they are constantly in the cycle of worrying about, are they whispering about me? Are they talking about me? Are they laughing about me at me? And so they're not able to be present in class to be able to learn, to be able to really build friendships and relationships because they're always in this state of panic, thinking everything is about them. I said, Megan, you're right. I'm sorry. So I'm going to go to the school and talk to them because you can't keep going through this. And she panicked, grabbed me by the arm and begged me, don't go to the school, mom. You're going to make it worse. I'm like, Meg, what do you want me to do? And she said, nothing. Please just let me do it on my own, mom. Many times and throughout the years of, of speaking at schools, students do not want parents or adults to go in many times to really make a big deal about it. Um, and the reason is, it's not because they don't think the adults, the parents don't care. That's not the case. The reality of how it works is this. You have a kid who is getting picked on, right? And it's not such a big being, it's not physically attacking where cameras and teachers can see. Many times these are things that are done behind the scenes, very sneaky, under the radar, because they don't want to get caught, right? So these things will keep happening over and over and over to them. They'll try to tell kids to stop. They might tell a teacher, they tell their parents, but things continue to happen. If they, and especially in middle school and high school, have a parent come in or another teacher come in and say, I saw this happening to the student, the school then has to bring the other students that they said were involved in. They may check cameras, they may check to see what's going on, if they cannot prove what was being done or said through a camera and everybody lies and says, nope, I didn't do it. Nope, it wasn't about them. I like that person. I would never do that. They can't apply consequences. So what the typical situation is, is they will say to those kids, if I see it again, if I hear it again, there's going to be consequences, right? They call the other student in and say, hey, listen, we talked to them. They said it wasn't about you. I am sorry, but if it happens again, you need to come report it because we have to know about it before we can do something about it. This is what we want all students to be able to do. Come to a trusted adult and report it. The problem is, is that kids know over and over and over again that other kids are going to lie. And if it can't be proved, what happens is now they're considered snitches. Now they're considered weak. You can't handle it. You have to go cry about it. You have to go tell somebody. And so there's more of that imbalance of power um, that, you know, people with bullying behaviors have that will direct it to that child. And it really causes a, a lot of, of uh, discord between the, the kids. And I think there's so much more work that needs to be done to study the, the, the uh, steps that we handle these situations within schools. I think there's ways that we have to talk to kids openly and honestly about the fact that that if you do tell me about it, here's what I can do, but here's what I, I can't promise you that it's gonna be fixed automatically. I can't promise you that they're not gonna come back and say A, B, C, or D, right? But with you, working with you, how do we wanna do this together, right? How do we make sure that we can talk to the school or what are some supports or ways that we can work through this so that they have an open, realistic idea instead of us saying, you tell me, I'll fix it, we'll get it handled when you don't have control over another child's behavior or actions. With Megan, um, I did not go to her school. I let her try to work on it on her own, but I told her that if things started getting worse, grades dropping, I was gonna have to do something. and. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. You start seeing changes in their behaviors. So her grades started dropping, she was more irritable, frustrated, didn't wanna hang out with the other kids as much. And that's when we decided to switch her to a different school for her eighth grade year. It was not because I thought the other school was horrible. It was strictly because I thought if I could give her a fresh start in a new school, that maybe working through some of this she would then be able to have new relationships and see that she's not all of those things that she had been called throughout all of those years. Megan started the new school and things were going phenomenal. Um, she really started to blossom and 
look at herself in a way that, you know, it wasn't like she looked herself as this horrible person. She was really starting to be able to see that, you know, I can be pretty or I can, you know, people find value in my friendship and she was bubbly and fun. And as a parent, it was like, finally, this relief of like, my kid has found her place. Um, I'm not sure if this video is going to work. Have you, uh, were you able to find out with IT if the video would work or if I should just move forward? Yeah, you know what? You can try. Another option, uh, Tina, is, and I'm not sure if, it was, sometimes when you share your screen, there's, there's a little checkbox at the top that says share audio and video, uh, okay. like portion video. Um, so if that was selected, it might work. All right. Let me try this play and then I'll, we'll see. Yeah, there unfortunately some Nothing. audio coming through. Okay. Sorry about that. So then we will skip right past that. How about that? So um with Megan, you know, going into the eighth grade year, things were going phenomenal. Um Megan asked if she could have a MySpace account. And MySpace, some of you may have had a MySpace account in the day, some of you may not be aware of it. Uh, but MySpace was just the new social media site that was out there, no different than TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook of today's world. Megan wanted this desperately because that's what all of the kids had. And I was definitely a parent that was very protective. And I said, you know, Meg, I'm, I'm worried about sexual predators. I'm not comfortable with this. And of course, she was like, seriously, mom, you're, you know, you're too strict. Everybody, everything's fine. Please, can I have it? So I researched it and I did a lot of rules that would not work in today's world. I let her have the MySpace at almost 14 years old. The password was, um, I had the password. Megan did not have the password. Her profile was kept private. I had to approve any images or anything that went on the profile. And then also I had uh, computers in open spaces and I even had a program monitored every instant message because it was also AOL instant messenger and every website. Um, Megan did tell me I was a warden of a prison that there was no other parent as strict as I was, you know, and I took that because it really, it wasn't to try to make your life miserable. And I tell kids this all the time as parents, we're not trying to make your lives miserable. We are doing everything that we can do to protect you, to make sure that you're safe, that there's so many things out there that I know it can feel like that, but really our intent is to make sure that you are safe. Megan started the MySpace, adding friends from her old school and new school, and you know things were going really well. She got a friend request from a boy by the name of Josh Evans and asked if she could add him. Megan's words, this was an almost 14 year old girl, said, mom, please, can I add him? He is so hot. And I was like, Meg, do you know him? Is he a friend of another friend and she's like mom he is just hot please i know that every time i share this and tell people that i let her add josh evans i know there are people that kind of sit back and are like what why would you do that you you had all of these rules but why would you let her add somebody that she doesn't know here's the thing i knew my kid i knew that back then even with dial up she could go to the library, she could go to a friend's house, she could create an account, add him, and I would have no clue. And in today's world, it is a split second that they can create separate accounts, hide them, we have no clue, add people that we don't know because they are so fearful that we are gonna shut their account down or take their cell phones or devices away that they will hide them. And the rule with Megan was, here's the thing, if I see anything negative, anything sexual he is deleted immediately and again i had the password to her account back then megan added josh josh told megan she had beautiful smile and great pictures and you know they talked back and forth and then started seeing that they had some mutual friends 
I was the mom that always say, you know, don't put what school you go to, don't put what state you're in, don't put this, don't put that, to try to help her understand that we really don't know who people are online. It's now been about five weeks and Megan is still talking to Josh. Megan's getting ready for a huge 14th birthday party and she filled out all of her invitations and um, I dropped her off at school, picked her up that afternoon. It was October 15th of 2006. And that evening, Megan, after five weeks, um, received a message from Josh Evans saying, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. You're not a nice person. Wasn't a horrible message. Megan just didn't quite understand where it came from. And she even said, Mom, what do you think this is about? And I was like, Meg, I have no clue ask him, right? Just ask him what he's talking about. And she did, but there is no response. October 16th, 2006, Megan went to school. I picked her up that afternoon. She was in a great mood. We come home though, and the second we get home, she wants to sign on. She needed me to sign her onto the computer to see what did Josh have to say. I signed her on. I said, you've got a few minutes. I've got to take your sister to the orthodontist. The message came in, said, to Megan, you heard me, no one likes you, no one wants to be friends with you. And Megan was like, I, I am a nice person unless somebody's mean to me, where'd you get this from? What are you talking about? And I heard my other daughter get off the bus and I said, Meg, you've got to sign off, I've got to go. Megan said, mom, please let me finish this last message and I will. Typically I never did that, but I was in a rush this day. I went to the orthodontist office with my other daughter. I called Megan on the way home Megan was sobbing and I said, what is going on? And she said, mom, they're saying horrible things. I'm like, who, what are you talking about? And she said on my space, I get home, Megan is still crying at the computer. I said, Megan to get up, let me see what's going on. These were messages that went from Megan to Josh, Josh to Megan, and now Josh got two other kids involved. The messages that went around were back then, they didn't care about using your first and last name. And it was Megan Myers, a fat ass, Megan Myers, a whore. And those were about the nicest things. But now I saw that Megan was defending herself and saying, I'm not this, you're this. And I was like, Megan, we've talked about this. We've talked about the war of words. No one's going to win. And if you would have signed off when I told you to sign off of the computer, we could have dealt with this differently. And it's now it's this huge explosion. I said, you're not any of those things that they're calling you. And she said, who's going to believe they, me? They're going to believe them, mom. It's going to everybody at my old school, everybody at my new school. No one's going to believe me. And she took off running and she said, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. She ran upstairs to her room. I was still trying to look through this and see what was going on. But um, I heard her dad come up into the kitchen. So I went upstairs. And Megan ran up into her room and he was asking what was going on? Why was she so upset? And probably 20 minutes later, I just had a horrible feeling that ran through my entire body. I ran upstairs into Megan's room, opened the door, and I found that Megan had attempted to take her own life. The ambulance was called. Megan was transported to Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. And 24 hours later, 17 years ago yesterday, on October 17th of 2006, Megan passed away. Um, Megan was just a few weeks from being 14. She was this beautiful, amazing, vibrant girl that was planned her 14th birthday party, bought her dress, um, was getting her braces off the next day and had so much life and within 20 minutes, I, it was over, it was gone. And I, you know, there's still days this many years later that I still try to um, make sense out of it. And there's not a lot of sense, right? You know, it's, um, it's things that we go through things and we um, learn to work through it. And for me, this foundation has really, um, I think helped keep me alive. Um, to be able to keep sharing her story, to keep helping others understand the importance of life and the importance of using your voice and and how the things we say to other people, how they matter. Um, 
We did not find a, a note after Megan died, um, but my ex or ex husband at the time did find that there were two messages that were sent to Megan on AOL Instant Messenger from the Josh Evans that said the world would be a better place without you and have a shitty rest of your life. Those are messages I didn't see. Um, we had no idea what happened. Um, I thought maybe it was a kid that got scared because the Josh Evans account completely shut down after that day that she passed away. About five weeks later on uh, Thanksgiving weekend, we received a call from a neighbor down the street that I didn't know very well that said they had information regarding Megan's death that it was really important to come to a meeting. I wasn't happy because I thought people were just wanting to be nosy and find out about it, but uh, we were actually at this meeting and found out that this neighbor knew that Lori Drew, a mom that lived four houses down the street, her daughter, Sarah, who had been friends with Megan since the fourth grade, and another 18-year-old girl at the time, Ashley Grills, who was more of like a family friend, they were actually Josh Evans. They created that account, that fake account. They were the ones that were sending the messages back and forth. The mom was sending the messages for that entire five-week period. This was the same family that I sold them the house. I was a real estate agent. Megan would, you know, spend the night or she would spend the night at, at our house. Um, and their friendship really kind of fizzled when Megan switched schools. They heard Megan was talking about her behind her back. And that is why they created this account. Um, you know, I truly do believe from the bottom of my heart that when this was created, even though the most ill intentions, the most um, disturbing thought that an adult could do this to another kid. I don't believe that they thought Megan was going to take her own life. I believe that they thought it, it was funny that they were going to get her back or show her or catch her talking about her daughter. And the reality was that entire time Megan did not talk about her daughter. Um, you know, I could I could spend probably several uh, sessions talking to you about what it feels like um, when you you uh, encounter situations like this with grief, with vengeance, and it merges with sadness to um, you know almost despair of all of these emotions that that rage and trying to figure out that you want justice for what's happened, um, but we don't have time for that today. Um, I can tell you that the rage um, and the vengeance and the sadness and the grief were so real that I wanted somebody to, I wanted them to feel the pain that we felt every day. I'm grateful we had friends and family that kept saying, you have another daughter, it's, it's not gonna bring Megan back. And, you you can't do this. You're doing this. You're doing this now for other kids, other families, you know, and really pushed us to be able to stay away from them. Um, we did go to a federal trial in Los Angeles. Um, that was the it was my space, the United States against Lori Drew. And the judge, we did go through the whole federal trial, but the judge essentially overturned the case um, after sentencing and stated that. It would be unconstitutional to convict Lori Drew um, that many people lie on social media sites. And so she did not ever serve time, but the reality is, is that it was such a big case that it started to create a lot of awareness and policies and law changes within states, within municipalities, within schools. And so for that, there was a purpose and a reason, and it's really where from 2007 and after that trial, we pushed 100 miles an hour ahead with the foundation to go out with the intention of awareness and prevention and education and saving young lives and helping families. Um, and so, you know, I think that's where just kind of with emotions and all of that, I have put every emotion I have into this foundation and, and it's really how I survive to help others. Um, the one thing that we want to know and talk about suicide is that 
suicide is not bullying and cyberbullying are not direct links to suicide. So I don't want anybody thinking if the, somebody has been bullied that they're going to have those thoughts. What we do know is that kids who have been repeatedly bullied over periods of time do have higher thoughts and do have higher attempts. But that is why we talk about this so we can make sure that we are getting that information out there. Thomas Joyner is a professor out of Florida, phenomenal man who has studied why people die by suicide. And for over 35 plus years, he has uh, studied this. And this is a really important uh, graph to understand because so many times the word suicide, we will hear people say, well, you know, they were selfish or they're just asking for attention or, you know, how could they do that to somebody else? Don't they know what it would do? And, you know, on a logical side, yes, you could say a logical person would not do that to hurt another person because you would know how much pain is caused, right? But when people are in a state and they are struggling with mental health, they are struggling with many situations and scenarios that are happening, they're not thinking in that logical state. So what he states is that suicide is not something that is easy, right? That we are born with these survival instincts. And so to show this graph, that people who have thoughts of suicide, they have this thwarted, a thwarted belongingness that they are alone. Now on the outside, they may look like they have therapist, friends, family, the world at their feet. That is so deceiving many times because that looks good on the outside, but it's what they feel in the inside. You know, after Megan died, I had more people surrounding me than ever in my life. But I have never felt so alone in my entire life. I felt like they were out there in this fog, in this mist, and I could see them, but I couldn't really hear them or really understand them. That's the aloneness that many times you can feel. The perceived burdensomeness that you're a burden. Um, many times people know that they are the ones that always need to go to the doctor's appointments. They're the ones that sometimes families get upset they cry, they are angry. Sometimes they worry about insurance, um, medical bills through, I mean, family dynamics. There's a lot of things um, we know that with sometimes when people lose jobs or don't get scholarships or don't get certain things that they start feeling like they are a burden to the people that they love. And even though we may not feel that, that is what they feel. It's why there's so much work that we need to do on educating and making sure that we get them into a place to know that they do matter, that they are not a burden. And then it's the capability for suicide that I'm not afraid to die. And when you have all of those converge, that is in the center where you can have that desire for suicide or that near lethal suicide attempt. And so I show you this because if you ever encounter somebody that says suicide is the most, um, you know, ignorant, uh, selfish act somebody could ever do, it's to be able to help other people understand that to them, it wasn't being selfless or selfish to them. If they were thinking logically, that would make sense. But really, they were struggling and in so much pain, they didn't know how to make the pain stop. And that is the number one thing that I hear from people who have made attempts. When we talk about uh, bringing it back down, I wanna check my time with bullying. Um, this transcends across whether you are a kid in school, in college, or you are an adult. People are rude. People are rude all day long. And in the world we live in today, people say things and do things unintentionally meaning to hurt another person, but it comes off as short, it comes off as rude, and we feel like, well, they're attacking us. If somebody says something that is rude, it is rude. And many, it can still upset you, it can still embarrass you or hurt you. It does not mean that they are attacking you or that it is considered bullying. If they say something mean directly to you, you know, something that you that they know will cut through you, hurt you, embarrass you. It's mean. It is hurtful. You probably don't want to hang out with that person, right? But 
it's not considered harassment or bullying if they do it one time. What bullying has to do is bullying has to be directed to a person or a group of people. It has to be repeated in nature, right? So it cannot just be a one time, I think you're a jerk and now we're bullying, right? Or taking their belongings and now they're bullying. It is, that's rude, that's mean, that's, you know, but if they continue to do it, now when they've directed it, it's repeated and they have this imbalance of power, which means the imbalance of power is, it is not whether it's not your stature, your size, um, it is not male or female form, it is truly being able to look at situations when you know something about another person and you feel that you have this power to use it against them because you know it may upset them, you know it may embarrass them, you know that they don't like it when you do it, and now you have that power to be able to do that and control that situation, you can use that and that's really where that imbalance of power comes into. Um, the different forms are done verbally. So it's not just punching. The old days were if you did not come home with a broken arm, a bloody face, then, and you didn't take care of yourself, then it's not be really being bullied, right? And, and still in some places today, that's the case where it's like, you know, don't take that, don't show them, you know, or you need to show them. And most of the time kids will say, they would rather deal with a punch than all of the verbal bullying that happens or social relational. So verbal is the name calling, the taunting. Um, social relational is the one that happens most often. It is the one that is most damaging because it is so under the radar from adults to be able to see it. That is the excluding people on purpose, whether they're excluding them online, whether they're excluding them in person in a group whether it's in a group chat and spreading rumors, right? Spreading rumors about them, whether it is their friend, their family, they spread rumors and these rumors, it is impossible to stop a rumor. It's impossible to take a school of people or a group of people that have heard a, a, a rumor, whether in person or it's spread or on social media, to get then to stand up in front of them and then say, this is a lie, this is not true. Because our society automatically kind of makes judgment, right? So when people then stand up to try to defend themselves, then it's that thought of like, well, they're just, see, now they're standing up, they're making it even worse for themselves. So now, it, now people even believe it anymore or even more than what they did. And so it's like this no-win situation with rumors. And we talk to kids about even adults, that the more that you try to defend, the more that you try to fight back in person or online a rumor, the more fire that you give it, and you're giving them more power because they know that it is bothering you. You cannot change the fact of a rumor that's already gone out. You can't take it back. And so if you don't want to be part of rumors, do not be a part of a rumor with somebody else. Don't stand there and talk about somebody else or be in that mix when then all of a sudden you don't like it when it's happening on your side. You walk away, I'm not dealing with drama. I'm not dealing with rumors. You know, it, those are the only ways that we're gonna get people to stop doing those situations. And then of course we have physical, the hitting, the shoving, um, you know, the tripping, taking belongings. What causes bullying? Uh, this is for many different reasons. It, it can be bias, prejudice, discrimination, stereotype, um, in our world today, it can be 150 different things, right? It can be out of jealousy because, you know, you were friends before and now you are friends with another group of kids or you're in a relationship with somebody that that person used to be in a relationship or um, you don't like the way that they look. You don't like the way that they talk. You think that they think they're better than you. They're too smart, you know, they're for whatever reason. There is a million things, but many times it is that that um, you know where we can see them. We watch people. We pay attention to the way that they walk, they talk, their body size, their language, their skin color. You know, and so it, it's really hard to pinpoint everywhere that it happens. So we need to understand that 
within school settings, many times even in our world, um, that we definitely have kids who are um, dealing with a lot of racism still. Um, we are dealing with a lot of um, the LGBTQ um, bullying that is happening, isolating that is happening. It's changing in a lot of states and a lot of uh, school systems. And so I think it's really important that we stand with our foundation stands to support people from every walk of life, because if there's any injustice to them, it's injustice for all of us, right? And so if they don't have the same rights that, that we all have to be able to go into a school, to be able to go into a workplace, to be able to go into a building, then we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we live in society that accepts people. Um, Cyberbullying um, is now just used through any of our electronic communications, right? So that is whether it's a, a phone, a computer, an iPad, whatever it may be, gaming device, it's willful and repeated harm inflicted through the use of computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices to harass that person. One of the things that I want to go over quickly, and I'm sorry, I keep looking down to check my time, um, is Cyberbullying absolutely happens. That is when somebody can create fake accounts, when they are talking about another person, when they are directing messages, they have other people join in. They take images and manipulate images. They manipulate conversations. They post those out and spread those out to be able to get other kids to see it and read it. And the, the hard part about social media is that that when you're the one that's attacked, you feel like the entire world is seeing what everybody's talking about. Now, it may only be 10 people, but we know that things go viral and that sheer panic of sitting at your house thinking that this person's gonna see it and this person and this person, and then they start getting text messages and notifications to people liking and commenting and sharing. It is just this huge overwhelming situation that they struggle with, it's real. The other part is that our emotions um, with social media. So that you're, this person may not be cyber bullied, but they're scrolling through social media and they see that everybody's hanging out and they weren't invited. That everybody looks like they're getting together for the holidays, but their family is struggling, right? They, somebody got accepted into a college and they didn't. Somebody got, you know, the millions of things that happen throughout a day and it's that fear of feeling missing out, not good enough. Why does everybody else seem to be happy and doing good and I'm the one struggling? And so I think it's really important to talk to people about that feeling, even adults, of you know when you start feeling that way, to take that social media, put it down for five, 10 minutes, go for a walk, go you know shoot hoops, go cook dinner, go do something to remind yourself that don't compare yourself to those people online because the reality is that stuff's not real. So often it's so manipulated. I'm gonna go through, I, I will send these um, over, uh, the slides over just so that you they could be shared with anybody. But one of the things that we also are seeing, um, which we have since we've had cell phones is sexting. So sexting in many different states, there are sexting laws and in other states, there are not. It is child pornography laws. What we need to know about the fact is, is if you have, take a photo, which is nude or partially nude photo, and, and that person is 17 years or under, when they take it on their own device, they can be considered with manufacturing child pornography. If they send it to somebody distributing it, and if they receive it on their phone, somebody be, could be considered in possession of child pornography. What we also have to understand as adults is this too, is that if you are 18 or over and you on your phone, it does not matter if you are 18 years old and you have been dating a person that is 16 and you've been dating them for years and you on your phone have a picture or a video of somebody, that person who is nude or partially nude, there could be severe consequences. And in some states, you could be charged with child pornography. And so it's making sure that you really understand your laws. You think about who you're sharing these, um, these images with, knowing that once you share it, you will never ever get it back. No relationship is foolproof, 
I don't care if you're married. I don't care how long you've been in a relationship. Uh, devices can get hacked. People can get mad. And you have to know that when you're sending these images, that if there is a possibility that they can get leaked. Um, and so what we're seeing is that um, the FBI has done quite a few uh, uh, task force task force um, because there are boys who are, you know, high school and college age that have been in relationships with people online that they haven't met. And they are then after a period of time, they've been groomed. They will send a nude image of themselves. And when they do that, they are now having sex torsion, which means that that person on the other side is now saying, aha, you sent me this message. I'm not really who I said I was and send me $5,000 through cash at Venmo. And they are in these horrific situations and these young men have been taking their own lives. And here's the thing, it's not because so much of the video that's out that they are really struggling with. It is the pure shame that they feel because they got taken and all of this conversations that they've had and shared with people and told them about this person that they now feel this total shame that they were taken advantage of. And that's where you really see them struggling a lot. And so talking about these conversations, making sure that people understand to be really open and honest and understanding of what to do um, is going to be really important and not judging people when you find out things have happened because they already struggle enough. We know that cyberbullying takes place any play, anywhere that it possibly, um, there's an electronic device, no matter what it may be. Um, the last few slides on the psychological impl implications in the bully brain. So we sometimes forget why kids absolutely panic when they are excluded, left out. It is because their brains are not fully developed. So Lawrence Steinberg states that some brain scan studies suggest that when peers are excluded, that they respond to the threat the same way that they would to their physical health or food supply. And at a neural level, they perceive social rejection as a threat to their existence. It is why they panic and why they think tomorrow is not going to come. And when we say it's going to be fine, it's, you know, you'll want, just wait till you get into middle school or high school or college. To them, that feels like a lifetime away. Right now, in that moment, it is pure panic because they cannot see beyond that. Um, we know that they're doing more studies to be able to show how repeated bullying does truly impact the brain, um, that they can show the same similarities that combat soldiers can show with post-traumatic stress syndrome. One of the adult strategies that I will share with you is that saying you should have why didn't you do this? You would, it would have been different if you had told me it was the least likely to have positive effects for youth. The connection, support, and reframing, which means when, they, when an adult listened to the student, when they encouraged them, when they checked back with them over time, that is where they had the most helpful, the most supports for kids who were struggling through these situations. And it's the last slide that I'll bring you to, which is probably out of all of these slides, the one that has, to me, is the most valuable and it doesn't cost anything. It is learning how to be able to validate another person's feelings. It means to actively listen. So when somebody, whether it's a, a partner, a spouse, a coworker, your child, when somebody's going through something, you can tell they're heightened, right? And we want to be a fixer. We want to fix it. Tell them what to do, how to do it. We're going to fix it and make it better for them. Many times we cause so much chaos because they don't want us to fix it. They want us to listen. So when you know that's happening, actively listen. Put down what you normally would do. Don't cook or do all the things we're doing, right? Look at them. Listen. And then think about duct taping your mouth. I know it sounds ridiculous, but we always want to interject before they're done. Clearly, Fully listen to what they have to say, and then when they're done, you want to validate it, which is, I hear that you're really scared, or I hear that you're mad, or I hear that you feel it's unfair. And that has to be really hard. You know, thank you for talking to me. What can I do to help you? How do we work together? What are, you know, and a lot of times people say, 
you just listening to me helped me, right? Or I just needed to get it off my chest because you want them to know that you're the safe place. You want them to come and talk to you when things are hard and not be fearful of being judged or angry or frustrated. So that that listening, that validating um, and, and communicating is so crucial in our relationships in our world today because all of us just wanna be heard. We just wanna know that somebody cares. And I will, I have a TED talk on that. Um, so if anybody ever wanted to go to our website and learn more about that, you can look at that. Um, I wanna make sure everybody is aware and has definitely the 988 suicide crisis and lifeline available. And so there's tons of supports where you can call 988, you can um, text them or, and, or you can chat with them. And so making sure that you know they're 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're available. Um, and I just wanna make sure that people know that your life matters and your voice matters and the things that you go through are so important. And to find those people that will listen to you sometimes all you need is that one person and so if anybody is out there that has struggled or is currently struggling please use your voice please reach out you matter and my hope is is that helps um, some of you so you share it with anybody that you can so that we can keep saving lives so i truly appreciate all of your time Tina, thank you so much. Uh, we're almost right out of time. And, um, but I think if you don't mind, let's see if there's a couple, I don't think we really have any questions, just a lot of comments uh, in support of you uh, telling your story. And as a father of three young girls, I echo those comments of support as well. Uh, thank so you. thank you. Um, doesn't look like there's a lot of questions. One of the things that came up a couple times was if we can share this PowerPoint. Um, yes. I'll have the email of everyone so uh, I can email that PowerPoint to everyone. And I think the video that you were going to show uh, is also on your YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, that, yeah, you okay. can use that. But I, yeah, I always, that's why I'm like, record it, send it, share yeah. it. Because <laughs> the more that we can do that and share with people, the more that we're going to save lives. So absolutely. And if there's ever questions, anybody can always email me and we'll we'll try to provide you any supports that we can. Great. Thanks so much. And as Tina mentioned, I put the, the link to the Megan uh, Meyer Foundation website in the chat. I would urge everyone to uh, go visit that website. There's a lot of great resources out there. I didn't even realize there was a, a Megan, Ma Megan Meyer day, which is really yeah. cool. So yeah. a lot of great ways to continue your support, get resources and help. Um, and uh, you can connect with Tina uh, through various methods as well. Other than that, um, Tina, thanks again so much. Really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you sharing your story with us. Wonderful. And we just launched the new website yesterday on Megan Meyer Day. So if you see any links, we have been testing, testing, testing. If there's anything that's not working, want something you want to see there, please let us know. We want to make sure that's there. So um, again, we appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me, Jake. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Tina. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.